Christ appears, he looks at man and he says, I know a covenant was made between Abraham and God, but I want you to know I'm making a much better covenant because the covenant that I'm going to make, I'm going to pick a man who has sin to make that covenant. So people are looking around, who is that person that could make a covenant with God who has no sin? Because in response, when God is going to keep up to his covenant, he's looking at the other party who has to be obedient to the covenant that that party is making with God. You can't find anyone in that condition. You can't find a man that will say, I have no sin. You can't find a man that will say, I will keep up to every part of the covenant that I'm making as a human being. So therefore, Jesus Christ comes. You believe that Jesus Christ was man? Amen? Yes. He was man. So Jesus Christ now comes. And when he comes, he is looking at God and he's telling God, I am man and I am representing man and I'm going to make a covenant with you. And so it's, it's man with God. And listen, my brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus Christ was also deity. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So I'm looking at the humanity of Jesus Christ and I'm looking at the divinity of Jesus Christ. Both of them come together and they're making a covenant by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. It was not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of the Lamb of God that had no blemish, that had no sin, that was precious. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was shed. And my brother, my sister, upon that blood was standing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the divinity that was in Jesus Christ was standing there as well. Two parties coming into covenant. Amen? Now, when I look at the new covenant, in comparison to the old covenant that was made between Abraham and God, I find the new covenant to be more binding, to be more strong, to be more uh, of a greater blessing to us. So now as men, and we as men are looking and we are saying, you know, I mean, I can't keep up to every part of the covenant that, uh, that God is wanting me to keep up with. I cannot be obedient 100%, but I thank God I cannot, but the man Christ Jesus can. Amen? Now that does not give us license to go do what we want to do. But we are so thankful to God. Because Jesus Christ, as man, made the covenant. And that's the reason why, before he left, he took bread in his hand. And he said, this is how my body is going to be broken for you. He took the cup of wine and he said, this is how my blood is going to be shed for you. For this is the new covenant that I make in. Amen. So in the new covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ comes and a covenant is being made. Now, let me take you back. To the name. Now, after having said all this, I want to show, I'm showing you the goodness of God wrapped up in all this. But what is even more important for you and for me, that he has given Moses the name, which is a covenant name. Amen. He's given Moses the name, which he gave it to Abraham. And my brother, my sister, he's given you and me that name as well. We go out in the name of I am. Now, I want to know, where did this name come from? If God is introducing himself by his name, I want to know where did this name come from. You know, when I was born, my parents thought of a name. When you were born, your parents thought of a name. So the name came through your parents. Amen? Where did this name come from? Go to the book of Micah, chapter 5. And let's read verse 2. It says, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be so little among the thousands of Judah, yet one of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler, whose going forth have been from old and from everlasting. Now, in the Hebrew text, this is what it says. It says, 
whose name came from even before creation. Amen? So, if his name is I am, if he gave it to Moses, and then he told Moses, this is my name forever. How long is forever? Forever. Amen? This is my name forever. So, if it's my name forever, then it had to come from somewhere. Where did it come from? It came even before creation. It came even before the foundation of this world. That's where his name came from. Go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, or let me rephrase it over here. His name shall be called, I am Wonderful, I am Counselor, I am the Mighty God, I am the Everlasting Father, I am the Prince of Peace. So it, this is his name. Now my brother, my sister, when his name was given and the angel brought this name and was announcing the name to the uh, to uh, the shepherd over there, and then there, thereafter to Mary, even before Jesus Christ was conceived, you shall call his name Jesus. My brother, my sister, it was not a name that just came from the mind of God. It was a name that came even before creation, even before the world began. The name of God was I am. It was given to Abraham. It was given to Moses. It's given to you and me. Amen. Hallelujah. And then the scripture says in verse 7, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with judgment and justice from henceforth even unto forever. Now I'm excited when I read that verse of scripture. The reason why I get excited because when the Prince of Peace was born on this planet 2,000 years ago, when he came, this is what was being announced 700 years prior to this by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was announcing the birth of Jesus. And what Isaiah was also adding at the birth of Jesus Christ, he said, when he is born, henceforth, a reference to time, when he is born, he says, there's an end of one government and there's a beginning of another government. Amen? The government of the devil has come to a close at the birth of the Messiah. Can you say amen today? His government does not exist as far as you and I are concerned. Maybe out in the world. He's still, you know, having his day out over there. But my brother, my sister, for you and me, that government does not exist because there's another government that has overthrown that government. And I won't say replace that government because that doesn't happen. But what God Almighty has been doing, he overthrew that government and he said, now my government will take over. And when my government takes over, there is peace. When my government takes over, there is blessing. When my government takes over, there's happiness, there's joy. And you know, the list goes on. My brother, my sister, you and I need to be excited because we are under another government. The government of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The government that, that rules and dominates every other government because there's one person over that government and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Satan has no dominion over us. He has no authority over us. He can't even do a thing against us because we come under another government and we come under another system altogether. We are not in the world system anymore. Amen. We are in the Jesus system. We are part of the Jesus culture. We are part of this kingdom. And my brother, my sister, this kingdom is surrounded by angels all around us. And the one who goes ahead of us, who is the captain of the host, with a drawn sword in his hand. And no weapon formed against you and me shall prosper. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. 
from henceforth, that means from, from the time of the birth of Jesus Christ came a new garment. And the garment is upon his shoulders. And the increase of his garment is peace. And it shall, there shall be no end to it. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it. My brother, my sister, I want to announce to you today that the time has come. You know, I mean, the moment has come where God Almighty is going to come down. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's coming down any time. But when he comes down, he's going to be enthroned on the throne of David. And that's where he's going to rule the entire world. And I want to see... Which person will even lift a little finger against the nation of Israel? Amen. Amen. And that includes you and me also being part of the nation of Israel. And we thank God for that. Hallelujah. Chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah again. Let's read verse 1. Just flip over to the next chapter. Chapter 11 verse 1. And then shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his root. Look at that verse of scripture. You'll find two things over here. Number one, a rod. And number two, a branch. There shall come out a rod from the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. You know, those who traveled with me to Israel in the month of October, they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I explained something to you. And uh, while I was explaining this, as we were looking at the olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, the tour guide said, these trees are more than 2,000 years old. Some are 2,500 years. Now, why are these olive trees existing for more than 2,000 years? The secret is this. If the tree that has existed for such a long time thousand or two thousand years old slowly it begins to decay so when this branch begins to grow and it sprouts and it comes and forms another tree you look at it and you say that this tree has existed for two thousand or even three thousand years because it's coming from the same root the hebrew word is called nitzal which means from the root it comes now i'm looking at this verse of scripture Isaiah has been writing this over here, and this is what probably he had in mind. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow from its roots. My brother, my sister, in, in, in a nutshell, I would say to you today, you cannot destroy an olive tree. Amen? And that's what some of the Islamical uh, radicals did when they took over Israel. They said... These people, you know, have a great revenue, <coughs> excuse me, coming from olive. So what we're going to do is, you know, whether we're here or gone, we're going to cut down every olive tree and they brought it right to barrenness. They chopped every olive tree and they were so excited and they said, now we want to see how these people are going to live on olive again because olive was exported all over the world. But what they never knew was, that they never were not able to go down to the root. And when they left and after they left, the tree started to grow again. Amen. Amen. My brother, my sister, that's a picture of Jesus Christ. That's a picture of the church. They can try everything they want, but the root is there. Amen. And that's why the scripture says that a root came out, a branch came out from the root. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign of the people to, and it shall be to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles will seek it. You and I are Gentiles. We will seek it and we will find rest and it shall be glorious. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We who are lost, we who are groping in darkness, we seen from the root grow a branch. And as that branch started to grow, you and I went after that branch and we received that branch. And by receiving that branch, we have been grafted into the olive. And my brother, my sister, since we are grafted into the olive, the sap of the olive begins to flow in us and we are flourishing this morning. 
we are flourishing. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you excited? Amen. There's a human lineage that passes through this olive that cannot be destroyed because its roots will always remain. Amen. And as long as the roots remain, the branch also shall remain. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you a question. When Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, the angels appeared to some shepherd people who were taking care of their sheep at the shepherd's field. The question is, why shepherd? I mean, don't you think it would have been better for them to go to the Sanhedrin? Because they, they were the ones that need to have the news, the Messiah is born, the Sanhedrin. Or, or why, you know, couldn't they gone to uh, the rulers or the elders or to some rabbis? Why shepherd? Have you thought of that? Suddenly the angel come to shepherd there, you know, you know, keeping watch over the sheep at midnight. Angels come and say, this day in the town of Bethlehem, the city of David, is born the Messiah. I'll tell you why. Because these shepherds over there are temple employees, employed by the temple. And their duty specifically was to raise up the sheep or the lamb that's born to be brought to the temple at the time of sacrifice, to be sacrificed maybe on the Day of Atonement or maybe at Passover to bring it to the temple to sacrifice. So they were employed to do that and they were found in the shepherd field. Now, if you go with me to Israel, uh, I, I will show you that this is the shepherd field over here and a stone throw distance, not very far away, is the place of the nativity where Jesus Christ was born. Amen? Where the temple area is, very close to the temple. So over here, the shepherd were, you know, were taking care of the sheep and the angels come and say, hey, listen, your job is over. You don't have to stay here anymore and raise sheep for the slaughter. The Lamb of God is born. Amen. Your job is over. The Lamb of God is already born. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you happy today? Amen. We don't have to, you know, uh, think of a sacrifice. We don't have to go to Bethlehem or, or go to Jerusalem on, uh, on the Day of Atonement or on, on Passover in order to sacrifice an animal. My brother, my sister, 2,000 years ago, the Lamb of God was born, and as a, as a result of his birth, the angels came and said, your work is over. That's why it was announced to them. Secondly, why in a manger? Don't you think he deserves to be born in a five-star hospital? After all, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Messiah. Don't you think a special place should have been reserved for him knowing that he was going to be born and no one else should have been allowed to be near an eye because the king of kings is born? Why a manger? Have you thought of that? Well, I got the answer. Where do you think the lamb will be born? Where's the sheep born? None else but in a manger. Amen. So I'm, I'm showing you the picture of the name that existed even before the creation of this world. My brother, my sister, that name was wrapped around human flesh and born in a manger like any other lamb that will be born in a manger. Hallelujah. I want to take you to the book of Genesis and I want you to read chapter 1. I want to show you something here, and this is straight from Hebrew. In chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, the very first creation of God, right, what we may call it creation of God, it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let me ask you a question. I'd like one or two people to answer me. Did God create light? No, I asked, did he create light? Yes or no? no. 
Everyone say on the first day God created light. It does not say that in the Hebrew. You know what it says in the Hebrew? It says light be. And light was. The reason why he said light be and light was. Because he is the light. Amen. And if he's light, why does he have to create light? But the reason why he said light be is because some millions of years prior to that, Satan was thrown out from heaven. And the moment he was thrown out from heaven, he landed on earth. And when he landed on earth, he is the author of darkness. And chapter 1 and verse 1, verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God made heaven and earth. Verse 2 says, And the earth was filled with darkness and it was void. And there was confusion on earth. Why? Because that was the residing place of Satan. He brought darkness. Amen. So where Satan is, there's darkness. But eventually, God is the light of the world. So when he comes to the place where darkness was, he says, Light be. And there was light. He never created. He just spoke it. Now, after having said that, I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 45. Chapter 45. Please listen to this. Verse 5. It says in verse 5. Chapter 45, verse 5. He says, I am the Lord, and there is none else Listen to this very carefully. There's none else, there's no God besides me. I gird thee through thou hast not known me. Verse 6, that thou may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I the Lord and there is none else. I form the light. Amen. Not create the light. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all things. Now let me take you back to these two verses I just read. I am the Lord and there is none else before me. There is no God besides me. I gird thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know me from now from the rising of the sun to the west. And there is none besides me. I, the Lord, and there is none else. You know, he's going on emphasizing that In other words, what he's saying is, now listen, my brother, my sister, we most often compare our God with other gods and we say that, look at him, he is, I mean, that's true in a way. You know, he's above everyone else and everyone else are besides him. No, my brother, my sister, no one is before him, no one is after him, and no one can be compared with him or by him because he is all alone by himself. We can't put him in the bracket with somebody else. And we can't say, you know, uh, besides him, there, there is no one else. Yes, besides him, there's no one else. Besides him, no one can ever exist. After him, before him, or anywhere. He's all alone. Why? He says, because I form light. I am the light of the world. My brother, my sister, right from the very beginning, right from eternity past to eternity future, he is the light. But we want to thank God that this God who stepped down from eternity into time and space and confined himself in human flesh to bring light to the world. And today he says to you and to me, You are the light of the world because you and I carry the light in us. Hi viewers, I would like to tell you that uh, the year 2015 has been a great year. But I want you to know that 2016 is going to be a much greater year. A year of blessing, a year of breakthrough, and especially for your families. Your families will be restored. Your families will come to the Lord. And I believe it's going to be a real fantastic year. So I want to pray with you and and, uh, release the blessings of God upon you and upon your family. Uh, So would you join me in prayer? Father, we come before thee this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. We give you praise. 
We give you glory and honor for every blessing that you have blessed us with and every blessing that you are going to bless us with. And dear God, I pray that uh, 2016 will be a prosperous year, a year of breakthrough, a year in which, uh, God, a fresh anointing will be released upon uh, every individual and their families as well, uh, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. We thank you, Lord, for every promise that you promised us from your word. And we believe, oh God, that you are going to release those promises upon the, upon the lives of every individual. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. So you have a great year. And uh, I pray that this will be a year of breakthrough for you and for your families. God bless you.